Good morning. Who's excited to be here? So first and foremost, a uh, big thank you to Sean and the entire Communications Network team, not just for another exceptional conference experience, but for affording all of us the opportunity to be a part of a community that truly puts its values front and center. So what you all have managed to accomplish here this week is really incredible. I know we're all eager to hear from our next speaker, who I have the overwhelming privilege of introducing, so let's get to it. I have a t-shirt at home that I've been wearing a lot lately. On it, it says, girls just want to have fundamental rights. I wear it as a reminder that despite the enormous progress we have made, women's rights and women's power are still being challenged in significant ways. We've seen that clearly in the deeply personal, deeply fraught debates playing out in our country's main stage recently. We're fortunate that in these complex and consequential times, we have equally consequential women who are leading us forward. One of them is here with us today. She's a true icon for our times, making sure that fundamental rights are much more than just words on a t-shirt. Cecile Richards has been fighting for decades to give workers, women, families, and voters a voice and a choice lo since long before they were on our communal agenda. Throughout her career, she served as a union organizer, founder of Grassroots Political Coalition, Deputy Chief of Staff to Nancy Pelosi, and of course, most recently, as President of Planned Parenthood Federation of America. She's also named one of Time's 100 Most Influential People and spoke very powerfully at the inaugural Women's March. I couldn't imagine anybody better suited to speak to us here this week. In her new book, Make Trouble, Standing Up, Speaking Out, and Finding the Courage to Lead, Cecile speaks about the challenges and the joys of leading a life of activism. We learn that she's relentlessly principled, deeply passionate, immensely skilled. She's not afraid to do the hard work and to make good trouble, as she calls it. She cuts through chaos and rancor with truth and reason. As communicators, these are skills we all admire. Take, for instance, her simple stance. Women's preventative care, including birth control, is basic health care. This shouldn't be a revolutionary idea, but unfortunately to some it is. Or one of my personal favorites, if you're not pissing someone off, you're probably not doing your job. In her book, Cecile encourages young people to seize the moment, to make their own good trouble, and to find their courage to lead. These are lessons she's learned firsthand. In fact, she almost didn't interview for that job at Planned Parenthood. She didn't think she was ready to take on that responsibility. Thankfully, she did. Like many women, she put aside her doubt to lead. She met resistance with persistence, and she's devoted her life to the causes she believed in while raising a family. And she's done it all on the world stage while protecting some of our most fundamental health and reproductive rights. No doubt, as this community continues to make good trouble of our own, Cecile will continue to serve as a source of inspiration and a role model. Please join me in welcoming Cecile Richards. Thank you so much. That was lovely. Thanks a lot. Morning. <laughs> Woo! Okay. Good to see you. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. This is exciting. Um, thank you, Robin. That was awesome. And uh, I wanted, uh, before I start, I just want to really uh, shout out um, the Communications Network and Sean and Amy and the leadership to move our venue um, this morning. I know Local 2 came here earlier, and I'm really glad I was a union organizer for uh, all my formative years, and I'm really grateful that this organization stands with organized labor. So thank you for them for doing that. Um, so awesome. Um, and all of you, I, don't, I mean, I hope I get to meet some of you afterwards. Some of you I do know. I'm so grateful for the work that you do, that you, um, particularly now, lifting up voices that aren't um, heard, telling stories that otherwise would go untold, and beginning to paint a narrative, not of the world of how it is, but how we actually believe it could be. And I think that's never been more important uh, in this country. So um, 
introductions are important, since some of you I don't know, so I thought I would set the stage. I, I come from Texas, from a, all right, well, there's some times we have some things to brag about, but not often, but um, <laughs> I, I come from, a, and I'm gonna try to do this clicker myself, I, I, I come from a uh, long line of tough Texas women. This is actually my mom uh, and my grandmother, Ona. Um, so here's the deal. Um, my grandparents grew up uh, outside of Waco, Texas in the country. And in fact, they grew, you know, my mom grew up in a house that her, that her mother had built just through sheer grit and determination. She was a product of the depression. I mean, her deep freeze was like you could eat for a year uh, out of that thing. Uh, so when my, when my grandmother got pregnant, of course, she wasn't gonna go to the hospital. They didn't have the money, and that just isn't how it was done. So once she went into labor, she called the neighbor woman to come over to make supper for my grandfather, because of course it was unthinkable that he would in fact, even though she was in labor, that he would make dinner for himself. Um, so, but apparently, as the story went, apparently the neighbor lady had no experience killing a chicken, and that was what was planned for dinner. And so in the middle of labor, my grandmother Ona hoists herself up on one elbow and wrings that chicken's neck right from the birthing bed. And that is how Ann Richards came into this world, all right? So um, I think it's, uh, <laughs> it's important to remember, I mean, I think where we came from and, and uh, we think it's hard and it was hard back then too. It's interesting, so even though uh, my mother's grandmother in Texas could not vote because under Texas law, quote, idiots, imbeciles, the insane, and women were blocked from the franchise. Just two generations later, my mother would become the first woman elected in her own right governor of the state of Texas, right? Which is pretty amazing. Um, so huh, I know, I think y'all have been talking a lot about just how slow sometimes change is, but sometimes it's also important to take stock of where, where we are. Um, I learned a ton from my mother, and since this is a communications conference, I, I tried to pull a little bit on that. She was a natural storyteller, as was her dad. Uh, she went to Baylor on a debate scholarship, so she could pretty much go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, with anybody. But one of my favorite things about her is she was actually often called in by the Democratic Party to explain to candidates how to talk to people. Um, <laughs> It's just kind of amazing that something that came naturally to her seems so hard for a lot of folks in Washington, D.C., um, but I think it is actually the proof of the importance of the work that you do um, as communications professionals, because it really doesn't matter how smart you are if nobody can understand you, right? Um, in fact, mom used to always say, if my mama, Ona, back in Waco can't understand you, you're not being heard anywhere. Um, and I think it's just something important uh, to remember. So I have a little bit of Ann Richards wisdom for today. Uh, some is not gonna surprise you. Uh, never, never wear patterns on television. Um, <laughs> if you are going to run for office, for God's sake, pick a hairstyle and stick with it. Um, <laughs> Hillary said she told her that many times. It didn't work. Uh, and before you name your children, just think about how it's going to look on a bumper sticker, okay? These are important life skills um, to think about. So anyway, and also though, I'm going to share a few observations of my own from having spent 12 plus years at Planned Parenthood in the hot seat. Believe me, after that, I don't think there is any nonprofit um, organizer in the country that appreciates communications professionals uh, more than I do. So. The first lesson is something that you guys may have already been talking about. I don't know all the program you've had, but the first is that narrative change uh, takes a long, long time. And as mom used to say, repetition is our friend. Uh, it is only when you are completely sick of saying something that someone else has finally heard it, right? So um, when I first came to Planned Parenthood, I didn't actually know much about what Planned Parenthood did. Um, I mean, I had been a patient and I'd been on the board, but. I had a lot to learn. Uh, like a lot of folks, I assumed we were mainly an abortion provider, and uh, I was proud of that and glad for that work. But then I learned that, in fact, each year Planned Parenthood uh, provided more than 350,000 breast exams, for example, and birth control for more than 2 million patients. I found that we were the largest provider of sex education in America to more than 1 million young people annually. And it turned out that of all the preventive care that we provided, abortion accounted for only 3% of our services. Um, so, um, it wasn't too long into my tenure that, uh, some of you may remember this, the House of Representatives flipped, and then Congressman Mike Pence, 
uh, decided that he would start a campaign to defund Planned Parenthood, which would have meant taking away all of the federal funding for preventive care, not for abortion services, because federal funding doesn't pay for abortion services, even though I believe that is wrong, and women with low incomes have been disadvantaged for their entire, my entire lifetime because of it. Um, but that was a communications challenge, because people, of course, uh, don't seem to know that. But so I began to repeat everywhere I, I went the exact same statistics. Uh, one in three women have been to Planned Parenthood for health care. We did 350,000 breast exams. We did one, two, more than 2 million uh, birth control prescriptions. 90%, 97% of our services were prevent preventive care. And everywhere I went, there was a chance to teach someone more about who we were and what we did. Um, and then other folks started picking it up. In fact, I remember Deanna Zant, a young woman who was a, started a Tumblr site called Planned Parenthood Saved My Life. And folks just began to post their own stories about the role that Planned Parenthood had made in their lifetime. And so then, in the midst of all this defunding battle in Congress, I was about to go on uh, to Rachel Maddow one night, and I heard that Glenn Beck, who then had a, a TV show, that say on TV that only hookers uh, go to Planned Parenthood. And so let me just say, Planned Parenthood, we serve everybody, okay? We are proud to serve everyone. But almost immediately, um, a lot of other patients started posting to our website, including a woman from North Carolina who wrote, he's an ignoramus. I guess he doesn't know that many of, our, many of us military wives go to Planned Parenthood here in North Carolina when the doctor on base can't see us. Right. As mom would say, I heard America singing. Um, and I knew we had broken through to a popular culture when Fox and Friends claimed that actually women didn't need Planned Parenthood. They could just go to Walgreens for their health care. And uh, that night, I mean, it was an iconic moment because that night Stephen Colbert goes on and said, of course women didn't need Planned Parenthood. He said, yes, ladies, I'm pretty sure the pap smears are right between the Swiffer refills uh, and the cat food over there at Walgreens. Just look for the stirrups. Um, <laughs> And that's when I knew we had actually broken through. And of course, then Walgreens had to put out a statement saying, please, women, do not come to us for pap smears <laughs> or breast exams. We can't do that. Um, right? Um, that was a communication <laughs> success. And we did beat that effort uh, at defunding. And of course, we've been at it ever since. And in the process, we had the chance to educate a lot of folks in the public. But I think most importantly, from then on, every time I attended any public event, someone would rush up to me and say, did you know that 97%, 97% of Planned Parenthood services are preventive care? You have to start saying that. <laughs> so anyway, mom was right. So, um, which brings me to lesson number two. If you want to change the narrative, um, particularly on difficult things, I think we have to break old patterns and old ruts and norms that aren't actually working. And so I wanted to use the example uh, of the embedded pro-choice, pro-life language that has dominated the abortion conversation uh, or lack of conversation in this country for a long, long time. Uh, we knew at Planned Parenthood that this sort of binary, um, you know, go to your corners approach to a very personal topic like abortion it just wasn't working. Young people didn't want to be labeled with anything, and the majority of the country didn't identify with either term, and even some of our own supporters really resented that somehow only the people who were against abortion rights could be called pro-life. Um, and it was really ludicrous, and we were completely stuck. And so through a lot of research and conversation, uh, we learned that the vast majority of Americans actually felt that abortion was a really, really personal topic, uh, and that they felt like decisions about pregnancy should be made by pregnant people, not by politicians, and not by people in office and legislators, period, right? Um, but, but, that was, but that was really a revelation. Um, they also sort of felt like such a deeply personal topic couldn't be broken down just into a slogan. Um, and so we quickly had the chance to actually test this out in real life. Uh, it was fascinating. So right when I started to Planned Parenthood, the legislature in South Dakota had voted essentially to ban all safe and legal abortion in the state. And um, we could have sued, and I think it would have been found unconstitutional, at least under the court system we had then. Um, but instead, the folks in South Dakota, our leaders wanted to put it to the, there was a mechanism by which we could put it on the ballot to the voters. 
And I had just started. I think I thought, oh my God, these, these women were crazy. Um, why would we possibly do that? If you polled in this state on abortion rights, um, this it would absolutely come back as a as a pro-life state. It was incredibly risky. But they insisted and they organized a campaign. Uh, of neighbors talking to neighbors, folks in church talking to each other, uh, allowing people to actually have a conversation uh, rather than forcing people into one camp or another. Uh, and we quit using political labels. Uh, instead, we just talked about what voters thought about who should make decisions about pregnancy, pregnant people or politicians. Um, and when we open these conversations with an empathetic statement that well, abortion's a, it's a deeply personal issue and people have personal feelings. You could even see in focus groups, folks' shoulders just relaxed, that they weren't gonna suddenly now be labeled or forced into um, a certain position. And I'll tell you this, on election day, this, the voters of South Dakota overwhelmingly defeated the abortion ban in the state. Not just once, but twice. And then, yeah, it was actually really important. And then, then we did the same thing in Mississippi, again. It's not, it, it's not Berkeley. Um, voters in that very conservative state uh, defeated an abortion, a, a ballot initiative that basically would have essentially threatened access to all safe and legal abortion. And so what we realized is that for years, by using language that assumed everyone was on one side or the other, we were just talking past millions of Americans. And um, I just think labels uh, don't make change. People do. Uh, conversations with people do. And it seems like I know it's such an obvious point, but it seems like a really important point to think about right now in this hyper-partisan kind of locker-up mentality that we are in in this country. We have to start talking to each other again. So today, support for Roe and safe and legal abortion is highest it's ever been in this country. More than 70% of Americans believe in it, and I feel good about that, but I also know it's only because we began investing in having a conversation with folks uh, and getting rid of old, tired labels and putting people at the center of everything. So, which brings me um, to my third lesson, and that is an iconic image, I think sometimes can change, can change everything. Uh, so this is a completely arbitrary uh, picture, but I wanted to put up, because it's the night mom won the governor's race in Texas, and of course, I think it communicates astonishment, <laughs> joy, so much more like that women had achieved that no one had any idea was ever going to be possible. And I think that images can make very abstract ideas uh, real to people in a way that nothing else can. So the example I wanted to use was the fight to get comprehensive coverage for birth control under the Affordable Care Act, which may seem, a, seem like a small thing to you, but it's a big thing. So um, the trajectory of the whole fight over birth control coverage in this country is really fascinating. Um, uh, but it's the most important thing that actually happened in the time I was at Planned Parenthood, because when I first came to Planned Parenthood, we were just fighting to get pharmacists to fill birth control prescriptions. That's how bad it was. Uh, much less get it uh, covered in insurance plans. And candidly, if Viagra hadn't been invented, I don't know if we ever would have been able to get birth control covered, because it became completely ridiculous to say, but in fact, many insurance plans were covering Viagra and not, not birth control. Um, Anyway, everything we had to do in the Affordable Care Act having to do with women was a big fight. Um, one of my favorite moments was uh, when Senator John Kyle from Arizona said in a Senate hearing that he actually didn't believe um, that insurance plans needed to cover maternity care because, quote, I'm never going to need it. Wow, I guess he was past his childbearing uh, years. But um, <laughs> at which point Senator Debbie Stadenow from Michigan turned right around and said, well, I bet your mother did. Um, but... It was such a fight on everything, right? Get it? Um, yeah, yeah. So it takes even longer in the Senate to get it. So I'm just saying that's you're quick learners. Um, but I mean, everything was a fight. The fight to get pre-existing get conditions covered, to, to, the fight to get preventive care covered, et cetera. And then we decided, okay, we're just going to go for it. We're going to try to get birth control covered. Oh my God, you know, crazy idea. There were plenty of members of Congress who were appalled at this very idea. In fact, the House of Representatives, um, in their wisdom, decided that they needed to bring a panel of experts to talk to them about this important issue about whether birth control should be covered. Uh, and the interesting thing about that was the only thing that these panelists had in common uh, was that none of them uh, were actually on birth control and had never used it because they were all men. And um, 
But this image, a friend of mine took this, and then, of course, we sent it around to say, these are the folks deciding about birth control. And we started to realize that creating these images could educate millions of folks about what was going on in Washington, D.C. Um, then, of course, we had gigant we had young people dress up in birth control packs all over America uh, to begin to spread the news. Um, it was an all-out campaign, and absolutely, um, the best day of all my organizing days was the day President Barack Obama called me at Planned Parenthood. I just love saying that. I'm just going to tell you, I love saying that. So <laughs> thanks for letting me say that. Um, but he called to say that he was about to announce at the White House that from now on, all birth control would be covered for all people in insurance with no cost in America. And now 62 million women in this country have that. So it was totally worth it. Um, but. I say that because um, these pictures help make that happen. And honestly, before this, people couldn't believe that Congress wasn't going to cover birth control. It was like, no one's against birth control. But of course, they were. Um, and so when this current administration started trying to pass Trump care to take away um, birth control and maternity benefits, I mean, it's like back to the same, you know, back at the ranch, the very same guy who had led the campaign against William Parented, who's now vice president, Vice President Mike, Mike Pence, he called all of his old colleagues from the Freedom Caucus over to the White House to negotiate the final details. Um, so that day, I was actually at the Capitol. Of course, it was a pitched battle to try to save Ob uh, Obamacare and, and Planned Parenthood. And uh, we were fighting really hard. And so I hear they're all over the White House. I'm thinking, God, what I would give for a photograph of those men, all men, at the White House negotiating away, essentially, maternity benefits and birth control. And wouldn't you know it, just a few minutes later, Mike Pence, he tweeted out the photo himself. It's like, it was incredible. It was amazing. Um, so sometimes you're just lucky. And um, so, of course, we moved this photo out online, a photo of all the men who just voted to get rid of maternity benefits. And thanks to all the previous conversations and debate, the country was primed to see how absurd this was, which, of course, led to the creation of one of my favorite memes in history, which is, of course, the Golden Retrievers. These are Golden Retrievers sitting around debating feline health care in America, <laughs> all right? Although, at that point, I would have given anything to have golden retrievers negotiating our health care rather than uh, the Freedom Caucus. So anyway, I just think it's interesting. I just think powerful pictures tell a story and change the narrative, and it can help you make progress, especially when you're on defense. And um, I think it's helped make real for women and for men in this country what the fight is really about. Um, there's a quote by attributed to uh, Mayor Rahm Emanuel, which is, never let a good crisis go to waste. And at Planned Parenthood, that was pretty much our daily motto. Um, as my friend Don Legans would say, um, if the idea was when you're thrown lemons, make lemonade, we were like a veritable lemonade factory at Planned Parenthood. And the toughest moment for me of all the many fights we were in was the time I had to go into the lion's den of a House congressional hearing um, where I had the chance to spend a cool five plus hours testifying before a really hostile committee. And this was after a group, of, an anti-abortion group had uh, created um, fake videos and had put them out around the country to try to ruin us and force the defunding of Planned Parenthood. Uh, during that time, in fact, we actually had five congressional committees investigating Planned Parenthood. Now, just to put it in perspective, that's more than the Enron scandal, that's more than the financial crisis. I actually can't think of something that had five congressional committees. So I was ready. I had every fact and figure. I'd been studying up. But I quickly realized it really wasn't a hearing about a search for the truth. It was an opportunity, sort of like a TV drama played out on C-SPAN to try to um, humiliate me and therefore make Planned Parenthood um, look bad. Um, there I am. I have my sheriff's badge on, which I have on today. It was my mom's, which gets me through all kinds of things. But I did have one advantage on my side, and that was the truth. Um, and that seemed like a small thing. It's a really big thing. I didn't have anything I had to hide. I actually just kind of had to keep it together and keep my cool. And so when Chairman Jason Chaffetz opened the hearing, um, he blathered on, and then he rushed to his... Um, I know, I can't do justice to it, but he then rushed to his final to finish his statement with this amazingly dramatic flourish, 
that he sure would knock me off my guard. He was going to reveal a slide that uh, claimed was a chart from Planned Parenthood showing a decline in cancer screenings and an increase in abortion. Um, of course, as Rachel Maddow said later that night, it didn't even have a y-axis, which really irritated her. Um, <laughs> but uh, she's just so particular. But. Um, <laughs> More importantly, uh, as the slide went up, my lawyer pointed out that, in fact, uh, he whispered to me at the bottom, it stated that it was created by an anti-choice organization, which gave me the chance to say to Chairman Chaffetz, this isn't from Planned Parenthood. Maybe you should check your sources. And then we were off, uh, off to the races. Um, every, um, yeah, anyway. But, <laughs> no, but it's, but it was a really interesting, scary experience, But because um, every time I tried to answer a question, another man would interrupt me. Um, and they made personal insinuations about me, about my salary, about my qualifications, my knowledge. And that was when I finally realized, um, if someone is looking like a hostile mansplainer on national television, it may just be better to step back, be calm, and let them keep the microphone. And And really, that is kind of what I did. Um, and in fact, in the middle of the hearing, my son Daniel texted me. He had been watching it, and he said, Mom, I'm watching you on TV. You're doing such a great job. I think raising me all those years really helped you prepare for this hearing today. <laughs> um, and he's probably right. But I think more importantly, and again, this is getting to the main point, is that um, what all that day of hearing did on television in a weird way was allowed me to tell about the great work and the great care that Planned Parenthood provided. And in a, in a strange way, it was like a five-hour infomercial, which was not the purpose that, that Jason Chaffetz had um, in calling that hearing. But um, anyway, my fourth and final lesson um, come straight for Ann Richards, from Ann Richards. And that is, and you know this, but it seems worth repeating, the only thing that people remember are stories. That's it. And so these last 10 years, when I was at Planned Parenthood, in the advent of social media and of storytelling uh, and the rise of other, for, other voices being heard is fr frankly the most exciting thing that's happened in communications uh, in my lifetime. Um, Planned Parenthood, of course, has 8,000 stories walk through our doors every single day. Um, and I can't tell you the number of people who stop me on the street. Someone will stop me today and say, I want to tell you how Planned Parenthood saved my life. Um, this past year and a half, I think we have all been inspired by the bravery and courage of people sharing their stories, some of them in the last two weeks, um, people telling their stories about abortions, about coming out, and of course, more recently, stories about sexual assault and sexual harassment that have uh, been painful, have been buried under stigma and shame for decades, and it's time for that to stop. It is just time for that to end. Um, But um, in my journeys, I've met so many exceptional people who are bravely doing more than they ever thought they would have to. Uh, though increasingly, um, although they are exceptional, they're not the exception. So one of my newest friends uh, I met in Phoenix, Arizona, during the middle of the fight to protect the Affordable Care Act and Planned Parenthood, uh, Deja Fox was a 16-year-old high school student, and I met her along with other young women when I was there as, as they were planning for a big uh, town hall meeting with Senator Jeff Flake. So everybody was organizing, they had their signs, they were dressed in their pink t-shirts, but not Deja, because as she explained to me, she said, I think I'm going to have a better chance getting up to the microphone if I'm not dressed in, in a Planned Parenthood t-shirt. I'm like, this is a great organizer uh, right here. Um, so then I flew back to New York, and, but the minute I got on the ground, I had a text um, with a video link from the organizers saying, you have to see this. Um, and there was Deja, right up at the microphone, in front of a packed house of hundreds of people, all strangers, and she said this, I'm gonna paraphrase. She said, I'm a young woman of color, she started, and I haven't always had a parent to care for me. I depend upon Planned Parenthood for birth control so that I can finish school. So what is your right to take away that care and keep me from living the American dream? Deja Fox, 16 years old. Unbelievable, right? Unbelievable. So, and that's exactly what happened. If I actually showed you the video, standing ovation, women waving their pink pussy hats. There was, it was crazy. And then of course it went viral and millions of people saw it. 
But that's not the end, because then Deja went back to her high school. She fought and got comprehensive sex education in the classrooms. And this past spring, she got a full ride. She's now at Columbia University, the first in her family to go to college. And she is setting the world on fire. That's the future, my friends. Um, and then maybe a less dramatic example, but still interesting, just how people are on this path, I think, to activism. Uh, Lori Hawkins was a mom of two and a yoga instructor who I met when I went to Paul Ryan's district because he had said he was going to, of course, defund Planned Parenthood. And I thought, I want to go out there and meet the patients that we care for in his own district. Um, anyway, Pl uh, Planned Parenthood helped Lori get health care back when she was underinsured. And she really credited us with finding um, a medical condition that she got cured so that she could actually now have children. And she had this 12-year-old daughter, Delaney, who she um, who was really engaged too. So, so she and Delaney, not only did I meet, I met them there in, in Wisconsin, but then they flew to Washington, D.C. to try to go meet with Paul Ryan, who I guess was busy and couldn't see them. Um, that was their first trip to Washington together. Um, but then a few weeks later, and during the whole run-up to the vote over the Affordable Care Act, there was the one national town hall, I don't know if you remember, it was televised. And uh, I look up, and Jake Tapper is saying, I'd, I'd now like to call on Lori Hawkins from Bristol, Wisconsin. And there she is on national television telling her story. And um, so you'd think that would be enough. There's Lori. So, but this spring, I was on book tour, and I got a text from Lori, and she said, hey, I know you're busy, but can you call me? And so I, so I called her. I said, Lori, what's up? She said, well, I was just talking it over with my husband and the kids, and even though I just started a new business, I have to do more, so I'm filing to run for state senate. And this November, Lori Hawkins is on the ballot in Wisconsin running for the state senate, right? Um, so... I just think stories matter. Um, stories that you tell, stories that, that you lift up. I think, you know, stories about Deja and Lori, thousands more help people feel less alone um, in their experiences, in their passions, in their beliefs. Great stories help us all feel like we can make a difference. Whether we're heading a national organization or standing alone at a microphone uh, at a town hall. Stories are what inspire people to do more than they ever thought they could. And because of that, I'm just going to close with my favorite story. Um, so during, uh, I don't know how many of y'all remember, but when President Obama was running for re-election, it was actually a very close race. And uh, the first debate that he had had with Governor Romney had not gone well for the president. And uh, so the second debate, there was a lot of attention, uh, a lot of concern. It was at Hofstra University on Long Island, and I actually got to be there, and I was watching. And uh, so almost right out of the shoot, um, the president stated in the debate uh, that he supported Planned Parenthood and that he, all, he talked about the life-saving care that we provided to millions of women. And he said that because he said, I know that, that Mitt Romney has promised to get rid of that. Um, I couldn't believe it. I'm sitting there like Planned Parenthood had never been the topic of any presidential debate. And in front of 70 million Americans, the president is saying this, and then he went on to say it three more times. Not that I was counting, but I was absolutely counting. And of course, the president went on to win that re-election with the largest gender gap ever in the history of the country. But that's actually not what matters. Um, a few days after that debate, a woman walked into our health center in Houston, uh, right off the Gulf Coast freeway, because she had found a lump in her breast and she didn't have a doctor and hadn't been to one for a long, long time. So our clinician welcomed her, uh, as we always do, and said, well, we can see you right away, but can I ask who referred you, she said. Well, um, I saw President Obama the other night on television, and he said, you do breast exams, and that's why I'm here, right? Um, and I just always thought about that because that woman is why we're here. It's why what we do and what we communicate is so, so important. Um, I just can't remember a time uh, when the importance of lifting up each other communicating with each other has been more critical. Um, this is a moment when I think showing empathy, showing our respect for each other um, and for other people can make a huge difference. The work you do every day 
sheds light on the lived human experience, and most importantly, something that's gotten lost in that, in, in all of this, and that is our shared humanity. So thank you for what you do. Thanks for sharing your talent um, to help inspire, create hope, and change the world. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, so, um, <laughs> thank you. Thanks. All of you. Um, so, I thank you. Wow. I got to call my kids. <laughs> it's so in hard, hard to impress your children. I don't know. We can talk about that, but <laughs> I'm trying that every day. Um, so, I think we have some time for questions. I'm getting the nod from Amy. Yes. Okay. And I'm supposed to be. Okay. So, I'm just going to kind of randomly try to see people and call on you. So, if you have a question, um, Say it or anything. So I see you. Yes. Hi. Oh yeah. There, I think there actually are mics. Thanks. Well, um, my name's Krista. I'm uh, I'm here from Detroit. Thank you. I just flew in from Detroit I last saw night. I you were there with yeah. some of our people running for office. So thank you yeah. for doing that. Yeah. And thank you so much for being here. I think this is amazing. Um, I'm reading your book, and there was a, a sentence that I just read yesterday, and I think it was sarcastic, but I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> I sometimes am. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, it said, I'm looking forward to the day when um, men have empathy for what women go through, or something to that effect, um, about mm -hmm. having empathy for what other people um, face. And yeah. do you think that that's actually possible? Do you actually see that in the future? How do we get there to where people have empathy for people who are not the same as them? Yeah. I mean, I think, and I'm sure you all are talking about this, I think that's the single, one of the single biggest issues we have now is the lack of empathy, not just around gender, but race, income, immigration status, who you love. It's, um, and that to me is why making, why storytelling and sharing our stories, is the only thing I know to do. Um, and I feel like that's something that Others have done better than we did, and uh, frankly, in the abortion rights movement. And I think the, I just really want to shout out the reproductive justice leaders in this country who have been way ahead of the rest of the movement, of saying, we got to tell our stories um, because we're all people. Um, and it is, I mean, I'm not going to lie, it is unbelievably discouraging to have the person with the biggest megaphone on a daily basis take away the try to take away the humanity of millions of people, not only in this country, but around the world. And that's just something we gotta fight against. We are better than that. And I think the American people are better than that. Um, anyway, it's a whole other thing I've been thinking about. Just, I mean, as an organizer, this is a little bit different, but as an organizer, um, you know, change is like, it, it's like long. And if you're a progressive organizer, you lose more than you win, and then you win, and it's amazing. But I think that one of the things we have to quit doing is focusing on the folks that we can't figure out why they're doing what they're doing and focus on the vast majority of people in this country who actually, um, I believe, do have empathy. Because uh, we are giving a lot too much attention, not only to, I believe, the President of the United States, um, but to people who are, are like a negative influence. So, you know, let's just take the, let's take the hearing, okay? Which I'm sure we could talk about a long time. And it's true, I have, I have very strong feelings about Senator Lindsey Graham. I have very strong feelings about Senator Susan Collins. But I have even stronger feelings about Maisie Hirono and Kamala Harris and Amy Klobuchar and people actually stood up and like spoke truth to power. So we can't, um, in our fight for empathy, we can't allow the people without it at this moment to drag us down. And that's just really, really important. Anyway, thanks. I hope you like the book. It was fun to write. Although I have said this, this isn't really sarcastic, but it is kind of sarcastic, which is, why we need equity in representation. One of the reasons I think the Brett Kavanaugh appointment was so distressing is because there are three women, Sonia Sotomayor, Elena Kagan, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, they are carrying every woman in this country on their back and we owe them an enormous debt of gratitude. The thought though, that we're now gonna go to a Supreme Court 
of all white men again is just one of the most discouraging, um, discouraging things. So I have just believed for a long time that if, when we finally get to the place where half of Congress can get pregnant, we will finally quit fighting about birth control and Planned Parenthood and safe and legal abortion. So um, anyway, had to get that in there. Okay. Is that somebody way back? Yeah. Hi. Yes. Thank you, and welcome to the Bay Area. It's nice to be here. Good. So my question is about narrative change. As you were talking about, I heard you mention, you said something like the anti-choice people, and it's always galled me that we've ceded the word pro-life to the anti-choice people. Right. And I don't know how to, well, how can that be changed? Because people who are pro-choice aren't anti-life. We embrace life. We have no problem with life, but they've taken that, that concept and they run with it, and people keep repeating and repeating it. So how do we undo that? I agree. I mean, I, I, so like I want to go, yes, you know, amen. And that's why we've actually quit using the terms pro-choice and pro-life, at least at Planned Parenthood. I mean, it's hard, though, to make change, right? Because people want to know, well, like, what's the new slogan? <laughs> and I think it's actually there isn't a slogan. Maybe someone will come up. I think it's actually a conversation. And, and that's, that's the point I was trying to make. And I write more. I mean, it was, I kind of did the shortcut here, and I write about it in my book. But... It was really when you begin to have, um, it's funny, I'll, I'll use a very specific example. So in our advocacy work, we used to um, try to you know, help turn out voters who were sympathetic to Planned Parenthood, sympathetic to abortion rights, uh, birth control. And sometimes the pollsters um, all over the country would just, fig would just um, categorize people that were pro-choice and pro-life. And so folks just talked to the folks that were pro-choice. Well, what we realized is there were millions of people that weren't either that actually fundamentally believed in everything we believed in. They just didn't want to be labeled. And so by not talking to them, we were missing millions of people in this country. And again, that was why my example of Mississippi or South Dakota is if you just polled it and you listened to the pollsters, you'd say, oh, I guess, well, these folks don't support reproductive autonomy for people. But in fact, they do. It's just that we were missing them because we were trying to just put people in this sort of binary you know, label. And I mean, we've seen that on sexuality, we've seen that gender identification, all these issues. I think we have just got to get out of the, get out of this space of label pe labeling people, pushing them into a corner, and instead opening that conversation. But it, it's long, hard work. But I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, someone, oh yes, hi. Hi. Sorry, I just can't see that far. I think there's a there's a there's a here's a here's a gentleman with a microphone. <laughs> you okay, you got it. Um, thank you so much for everything you do. I had the pleasure of being a, an MC for several Planned Parenthood events in Chicago, and that was one picket line I was always happy to cross. <laughs> I'd wave at the demonstrators as I went past yep. to go in to do uh, the solidarity work I was thank happy you. to do. Thank you. Uh, but you talked a lot about the stories, and you yep. use them so well. As a communications expert or mm -hmm. practitioner, not an expert, it's really hard to get those stories. Clearly, you're out on the road and you're gathering them. I know you must talk to so many people. Mm -hmm. How do you capture those stories and how do you get your team? It's my colleague's job. Nobody tells yeah. her anything. I'm nosy. How do you get your team to help you capture and share those important stories? It's Listen, I love that question because... Uh, I, I kind of was, I had the same point of view when I started Planned Parenthood, which is like, what do you mean we don't have any stories? There's like millions of people that are coming into our health centers. And what I just kind of learned for myself is it was the stories I experienced that I could actually authentically tell. Um, and that was true for other folks as well. So I think partly it was actually training um, um, thousands of people, staff, volunteers and others to tell and, and listen for stories and tell their own stories. And now what we do, in fact, this last national conference, we had an entire day of storytelling training because we have amazing spokespeople. And the truth is, um, 
The best person to tell Deja's story is Deja, right? The best te person to tell Lori's or Kelly Robinson right there, one of our amazing organizers. So I think partly what this is is also like getting our own stories, beginning, you know, using them, but then lifting up folks who actually have amazing stories because they're everywhere. And that to me is the exciting thing is that, um, uh, is that people are now doing it on their own and not waiting until they're you know, the president of an organization. So, and thank you for your work in Chicago and everywhere else. It actually kind of reminds me of one other funny story, which is um, uh, about picket lines. So we, uh, I was headed out to, I do a lot of Planned Parenthood events, and there was one way out on, uh, in Long Island, way out in, at some kind of uh, club or something, but it was very hard to find. And, but of course, there there were huge, you know, picket signs and uh, angry people yelling at me. And uh, so I get inside and uh, this elderly lady comes up to me and she said, um, it's nice, nice to meet you. And uh, I noticed all those, those protesters. I'm thinking, oh God, what's she going to say? She says, I was so glad they were there because I couldn't find where to turn, right? And uh, <laughs> so we just have to make it work for us and in whatever, whatever way. Yes, gentleman there. And then I'll turn over his. Hi. Um, Hi. My name's Sean. I'm here from Boston. Um, Hi, Sean. I want to ask you about your mom. And there's so much in you that clearly comes from your mom, including her legendary sense of humor. And I want to, I wonder if you can talk about, share with all of us as communicators your secrets to using humor, particularly in times like these that are rage comes so naturally <laughs> that are so infuriating and and I'm working on really heavy and emotional issues and right. how you use humor on those right oh I don't know I'm not very funny my mother was really funny um, in fact I think now I'm so sorry she died before Twitter um, because <laughs> she uh, she was really uh, just like unvarnished unleashed um, I think that, I think humor does a couple of things. One is, especially when you're talking about difficult topics, it's sort of using humor and making fun of yourself or like I tell stories about my son Daniel, I'll, I'll tell you one in a second, which is kind of, and it just, it just helps people go, okay, this is someone maybe I can talk to or maybe I can have a conversation with because I think it's hard, particularly in politics as people just feel like, you know, everyone's like, you know, um, is at the, at the ready. Um, and look, we just have to sometimes laugh at the ridiculousness of the human condition um, uh, to keep from just being angry, uh, although I'm really angry too. Um, I don't know, because um, I don't want anyone to ever think that even if I can make light of um, something that, like the fact that Orrin Hatch at 84 years old is telling uh, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford that she must be mixed up, um, I just feel like um, it seems like sometimes we just have to point out the, some, some things that are just ridiculous because they are. Um, so anyway, I think humor is really important. But again, I think storytelling, that's how, if you're not really a good, I'm a terrible joke teller. In fact, I, I used to try to tell jokes and speeches and then I would go like, oh God, what's the punchline? So I think it's just better to do things that you actually naturally do. Um, but can I tell you this one other thing, which is kind of fun. This is funny. Actually, I was going to put in the speech, but I didn't. But since you kind of gave me an opening here. So, um, I, so I have three kids. I have Lily, who works for Kamala Harris, who I adore, I just got to say. So actually, I can't believe Lily's not here. She's her communications director. And in fact, she's back in Washington. Anyway, she would love all of you. And I would love for her to meet you. But in any case, um, and then I have twins, Hannah and Daniel. And Hannah was like, just like Lily, like, you know, just like, doing her homework, you know, on that hamster wheel, getting everything done. And her, her twin brother, Daniel, was like, she got him through high school, basically. I made him take a year off of college. I was like, before college, I said, Dan, you are like not ready. He was not ready. He took a year off, et cetera. He finally got to college. Um, and, uh, but he like watched cartoons all the time. I mean, he was a lovely boy, <laughs> but it was, a, um, <laughs> really, I love him. Um, but uh, I, in the middle of the defunding fight with, Mike Pence, uh, who we talked about earlier, uh, I'm like running around the country just crazy, like we're having rallies and this and that. And um, so I'm rushing down to New York to a big rally for Planned Parenthood and I get text on my phone because Daniel is now going to school in like Western Ohio, I mean Western Pennsylvania. And it says, hey mom, it's me, Dan. I'm in a busload of kids and we're going over to Ohio to rally for Planned Parenthood. I love you, Dan. 
I know, like, <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I was like, bra- I was so on the, my, my first reaction was, oh my God, Daniel, I can't believe it. It's so touch. And the other was like, okay, if Daniel's getting in a bus going to Ohio, we're going to win this thing because actually <laughs> folks have woken up. And so, which is not really why I tell you, th- but the reason I tell you that story is I used to tell that story when I was on the road. And three years later, when I would be back in Cincinnati again or Detroit, someone, someone would come up to me and say, how's Daniel? <laughs> right? So it's so interesting that they don't know Daniel, but they all had a Daniel in their life. And so I think, and sometimes, again, it's not really getting to your point, but it's something I've been thinking about. It's like becoming a human being to people and creating uh, empathy and connection, uh, it's funny how it can actually have a lasting impact. So Daniel's always the foil of every, um, every story. <laughs> well, sorry, okay, I didn't look over here. I don't know if there's anybody over here. There's somebody, yeah. Hi, Hi. Um, I'm Philippa from Hi. New York. Hi. Um, I work at a service organization, and we have a fellowship where these people who just graduated college spend a year with us and uh, do local service. Mm-hmm. And they're so active, and they're always fighting the good fight, and they're out every day doing volunteer work and, uh, and doing activism, and we are always worried about their self-care and their burnout. And you've had a whole career where it seems like you're always out there fighting. So I'm curious whether you have any advice about how to still take care of yourself, how to make sure that you're still you for your family and you're not putting all of your energy out to the world and having none for yourself. So it's a question that comes up a lot. And I'm going to say something that is not, a lot of people are probably not going to like. So I'm just going to, so I'm glad you kind of raised it. So I, um, when I got out of college, first of all, I live a very privileged life. I've gotten to be a social justice activist my entire life, and that's very rare to get to do. And the first job I had out of college is I was an organizer. I organized garment workers. I organized women who cleaned hotels in New Orleans, making the minimum wage. I worked with janitors in Los Angeles um, who cleaned office buildings who no one ever saw um, and who didn't have health care coverage. Uh, It was an unbelievable honor, and those are the people I will remember the rest of my life. And so um, they didn't have the chance to get self-care or not get burned out. They were just doing the very best they could um, to a lot of them single moms, taking care of kids, raising a family, uh, working two jobs. And so I I have to always balance the desire for self-care with the importance of getting out and actually meeting people who don't even have the choice to do what we do for a living. This is such an honor and a privilege for us to actually get paid to make social good. So um, I just have to... um, So, and and I mean, so some people just think I'm just a, you know, hard person. Um, And so, but there, and there's a part of me that's like that. Um, And we have to take care of each other. So I think it's important to get perspective. What does it really mean? What is our privilege? We really have to all understand that um, because we are all privileged in some way. Um, and we also have to take care of each other. And I, find, I was just in Detroit and this woman called me and she said, I, she said, my friend is just like totally burned out. She just is dropping out of everything. She said, she just, after the hearing, she just can't go. So she said, will you call her? And so I called her and I said, look, it's okay. Like, get off the field do what you need to do, we're going to all keep your space, and then you can come back in. Because I think that is important, that we actually all have to do more than we ever thought we were going to do. So it's okay to make space for people, it's important to check in on people, there's a lot of trauma out there. But it's all, I think it's also important to keep, keep in perspective that we are doing work that um, a lot of the folks in this country would, would love to be doing, and a lot of people, and that's kind of how I felt in that hearing, there was a lot of women who could have told a better story before that congressional committee, but they were never going to have that chance. So that was kind of on me to try to do the best job I could for all of them. So um, we got to keep focused on why we do this work, um, support each other, um, and remember the millions of people who don't have a chance uh, to do any of it. So sorry if that isn't satisfactory, but I think it's, it's what, kind of what keeps me going. So... Is that it? I have so much more. It's never it. <laughs>